This William Sheen could become quite a character. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Gian Cilento. Well, it actually wasn't William Sheen, it was Pitt the Younger. <laughs> it was an alias, I suppose. <laughs> yes, 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 right. And actually, a griffon was something that he kept in his study to supplement a somewhat meagre regulation supper doled out by the school authorities when he was at Eton, and it was a particular joint of meat, a lean part of the loin of a bacon pig, a griffon. Right. <clears throat> so it's a joint of bacon, it's a kind of a turf cutter that you can hit people with, and it's uh, the correct term for ship's timbers. And if we had William Breen here, we, he'd be our star witness. Frank. Um, <clears throat> we're having a little sort of conference. Of actually. course. If you could uh, do some private work for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> do make up mm, your mind. Yeah, it's simple. We're, we're without, yeah. without being totally confident about this, in fact, without having any confidence at all, um, I don't think a Griffon would be a turf cutter. I can't really amplify that. Yes, I can. I don't really <laughs> think... Um, 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 driftwood. Driftwood, uh, an Orcadian word, possibly. I think the joint of meat is so ridiculous that we're, we're going to lean for that. You, you lean towards it, do you? Yes. Well, oh, well, heavens to bed, I'm so slow. Um, yeah. Deanne, true or bluff? Anyone, dear, so. <sighs> Oh, no. Yeah, nothing to do with that. Here comes the true definition. Which of the other two has it? Some knowledge of Irish culture. Oh. <laughs> Good old William Breen turned up trumps. It's a turf cutter or hoe, that kind of my, a my class of an implement. That. My friend thought it was that. And they uh, I, it. I suppose you... Oh, dear. Gully. I'll never forgive you. No, no. Well, now, let's see what happens with this next word. Well, gullics? I don't know. Frank? Gully. Gullics, gullics. Is there an ichthyologist in the house? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the place is full of them. Were there an ich Well, you will know the pronunciation of this, because this is a word that an, uh, that an ichthyologist would know extremely well, because it's, it's a little tray... It's about all, actually. It's a little tray with a glass bottom and sand in it, which is used in the process of incubating fish. <laughs> Not a lot, really, to add, except that the incubation That's means enough. you put the eggs in there. Don't stay yourself. It's all right. <laughs> <coughs> <Incubation. coughs> so, <Enough. clears throat> well, let's um, get Kingsley Amos to define. Well, a Gulix made it easier to speak the ancient Assyrian language. It was the addition of a consonant to any word that preceded a vowel sound. The practice that we in England now follow, in that we do not say a idiot, but an idiot. Hmm. That's a good example. Yeah. Pretty succinct. Good chosen, well chosen word. Um, Hayley Mills, thought. I think it's your go. Well, <clears throat> oh. when an 18th century gentleman of fashion went shopping for shirts, it was a very rash haberdasher who offered him anything other than gulics for his shirts, because Gulix was a particularly fine linen cloth that was lovingly woven by craftsmen from Holland. Yes. Well, it's a sort of elision in the... Um, I forget what language it was, Kingsley, but... Uh, Syrian. Uh, Syrian, of course. No Silly of me. Uh, a hatching box um, for you hatching fish out of. In, and it's fine linen and stuff. Patrick. You couldn't have a, a word for an N that it gets glued onto an A. I don't think you could have it. But do you think you've got one? A suffix. You, of a sort. A gulix. A particular sort. Who's doing this, you or me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm helping you out. Now, back to work again. A tray for incubating fish. But poor little Haley dribbling about <laughs> a rash haberdasher <laughs> unwooed me. I think it's a tray for incubating fish. <laughs> yeah, well, Frank, Frank goes all that uh, stuff, too, or bluff? I do hope I'm right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> C. 
See, you gave the true definition. Here it comes. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Rasha, haberdasher, yet one all. Kutchi or Kutchi is the next one. Anton, your turn. When one sees um, beaten gold in a sheet, if one, if one does <laughs> see, uh, <clears throat> it is in fact beaten in a very special way. Obviously, it's so fine that if you actually touch it with a hammer, um, it would just completely disintegrate. So what they do is they put it between two sheets of vellum and then they hit it very hard and it spreads it so that it is a very fine sheet. And this is how they actually start the process of gold leaf when they use gold leaf for books, etc. And this yeah. is what yeah. a kachi is. Yeah. It forms the top and the bottom of a gold beater sandwich. So cool. Can you tell that again? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty scholarly stuff. Deanne. Or I'll dismount thee from thy radiant coach and make thee a poor kachi here on earth. How about that? <laughs> well, that is a couplet from a 17th century epic poem, thereby serving to remind us, one and all, that a kachi was, about that time, a simple coachman. A kachi. Simple. A kachi, a coachman. Um, 17th century. 16 something. Yes, well, now Patrick tells you a thing. A kachi is a screen made of finely split bamboo and string. You might be walking past a house not to put to find a point upon it, in Malaysia. I look at the house, I instead of a door, there would, there would be a kuchi, as we call it, in Malaya, on a split bamboo and string. Now, the interesting thing about it is that it's, it's green in color always, because in, in Malaysia, mm. green means peace and harmony. And you can hear the frying pans being, being banged around inside, but outside looks like peace and harmony because it's between the outside on the door. I mean, it's, it, instead of the door, I beg your pardon. I confuse you at the end, I'm not So it's sort, of, sort of Malayan screen, coachman, 17th century type, and a gold beater sandwich, what he wraps around the gold and then uh, to whack it flat. Kingsley Avis. Where, where was one? Yeah. Lad. I like the gold beater sandwich, as, as an idea, um, <laughs> but not otherwise. Um, as regards to that coachman couplet, I don't think in the 17th century it would have been blank verse, which it turned out to be. I think it would have been a rhyming couplet. So there it goes against the grain. I'll go for the green Malaysian split bamboo frying pan. Thing. <laughs> Thing. <laughs> yeah, right, Patrick, true or bluff, here he comes. One, two, three, go. All is peace and peace. Ah. Ah. Yeah. He just made all that up, he did. Now, who gave the true definition? Here it comes. Oh, Wait for it. Oh, what was you, was it? It's there. It Got was. the drama. One of you, anyway. Oh. Yes! <laughs> so all that academic stuff about blank verse went for nothing. No, pretty, really. But uh, it's a 17th century coachman. I'm not sure whether the verse is correct or not, but still, the definition is absolutely so. Spawn. Uh, Kingsley, your turn. Yes, well, spawn is a kind of sphagnum moss once imported from the Netherlands. And it was imported because somebody had found that the greenish water in which spawn had been boiled was efficacious in the removal of mottle stains on ivory. <laughs> mottle stains. <laughs> You've got to do it with something. Hayley. <clears throat> the spawn is a... Is a specially segregated area on a South African ostrich farm. It's the enclosure in which they put the young ostriches while they're penned, while they grow their first tail feathers, which ultimately will be fully grown and used by English debutantes to and Raj fan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't do without those tail feathers. Frank, your go. 
A spoon. Yes. <laughs> a spoon. Yes. It's a spectre. It's a variety of spectre, as could be conjured up by a practicing, fully paid up witch. <laughs> now, <laughs> there are spoon spotters who do say that spoons come in a variety of shapes. It could be a little goblin. A little <laughs> pranksome goblin. Yeah. Or it could be a man sitting neath a tree. Or it could be... You don't listen to him. A tall, tall, <laughs> the ship. Or it could be lying down. Oh, Spoon. Yeah. <gasps> well, it's a spectre. <laughs> Chill my blood, I can tell you that. It's fa and it's sphagnum moss, and it's, um, it's a pen where you keep the young ostriches until that happy day when they've grown their tail feathers. Anton, your choice. Well... You're out on your own, lad. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> These South African ostriches that Haley talks about, I don't really think there's much use for the feathers. Not really. Apart from the performance, Frank. <laughs> You're going to say the ostriches must the think so, must they? The spawn, the ghostly spawn. No. Careful retribution does not fall. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't actually have any mottled stains on ivory, but I do rather fancy the thought that a spawn would cure them if I did. You, you, so I'm going to choose You them. choose that one, do you, Anton? Oh, it was you, Kingsley you, Amis. Do you? Draw bluff. bluff. Oh. Ah. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't clean the models off anything. Well, who gave the um, true definition? Yeah. Oh. That's <laughs> shameless. Yeah. There's nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. Very good. I do, I do what you usually say to spectres is speak again, but I don't think I will. It's two all now, and uh, Spawn is indeed a spectre. You couldn't miss it. Owdle is an or Owdell is the next one. Diane. Well, an Owdell is a glass jar in the making or used in the making of certain cheeses, notably Lancashire and Wensleydale cheeses. It's placed over each newly made round of cheese for a period dependent upon local humidity, thus preventing over-hasty evaporation of the moisture content. Yes, I suppose it would. <laughs> Owdell. Jolly useful, really. Patrick, your turn. I really think that Owdell ought to be allowed back into the English language. It's an old word, you see. But it, it, it's got a very contemporary use, as it might, you might say, because it means to be busy in a, in a kind of trifling sort of fashion, kind of brisk inefficiency. And if you go if you're going to, going to any shop at all and selling anything, and one person behind the counter, and you can ask him or her for anything, and he or her, they're going to begin oudling instantly. <laughs> Bustling about with brisk inefficiency, doing nothing. Oudling. <laughs> Right. Um, Anton Rogers. We actually have to go to Wales <laughs> to find an owl. <laughs> and you might meet someone in a pub and you might say, How's your owl then? <laughs> now, this would only be in Wales because only in Wales do they compose stanzas of poems, at least 24 stanzas. For entry into an estate foot, they enter an owl. And one of the provisions is that each verse has to have a different meter. Gas meter. <laughs> Gas meter, <laughs> electric meter. And this is commonly called an owl. Not all that common, really. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it means to potter about doing nothing very much. It's a jar you, you use in making cheese, and it seems to be a very long, boring Welsh poem. <laughs> Hayley Mills, your turn to choose. Uh, 
Anytime you're ready over there. <laughs> so boring. <isn't> <laughs> if in doubt. <laughs> right. Um, me, 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 me. Uh, I love. I love the idea of having my cheese under an idol, but I've never, I've never come across one, and um, so I don't think it's that. <laughs> the um, the Welsh singing, no, that doesn't quite convince me. I I think it's I think it's the uh, the chatting, wasting time and so yes. on, pottering about. Yes. Patrick, true or bluff? You've never idled better. Oh. Ah. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. Let's hear what it was. Let's hear what it really and truly it was. was. It was you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very long, and I'm, I won't say any more than that. Very long Welsh poem. That's what it is. Oh. Uh, three, two. Ziston is the next one. Haley Mills is going to define that word. <clears throat> Ziston. Well, when a Roman housewife went out shopping and it was raining, she couldn't, for, for obvious historical reasons, take a, a Mac or an umbrella. So what she took with her were two slaves, where, and they, they, they carried this ziston. Now it consisted of a little canopy with poles, and they carried it over her, and she trotted along and did her shopping and kept quite dry. It kept quite dry. Kept quite Thank dry you. underneath her ziston. Not her sister. Quite dry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't have two slaves and a brolly any day, Frank. <laughs> we are in ancient Greece. <laughs> the cavalry is lined up, and the officer says, in, in Greek, <laughs> the equivalent of charge. And they gallop forward. But what do they have as armament then? They have a, a ziston, which is a, a, a spiked stick. <laughs> Not at all dissimilar to the spike stick a public-minded hell's angel might pick up waste from a waste paper after a pop concert. <laughs> what? It's a stick, a thing with a spike at the end of it. Ziston. It's, it's the ancient Greek cavalry weapon. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. King's name is? Xiston was the trade name of the substance used by the Admiralty in the later 19th century for drying out ship's bottoms. <laughs> it was a crystalline mixture, mainly calcium chloride. It was sprinkled over waterlogged timbers to hasten the process of desiccation. Uh, you could sing that if you'd an air to it. It's um, a sort of substance <laughs> for drying off ship's bottoms and so forth. It's a pike used by the Greeks, and it's an early sort of brolly, but it's carried by two slaves. Diane, your mm. choice. Well... We don't want our advice, I don't think. You know, you're, you're very wise uh, not to. <laughs> well, um, a Roman rain car canopy with two slaves attached. Gazistum. Gazistum. Well, that's... Hmm. Toying with it. Toying. Yes, I'm toying. Don't discard it. No, I haven't discarded good, good, that. Good, good. A Greek <laughs> waist stick I've got here. A yeah. cavalry weapon. Charge. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Well, all those words, end, I mean, starting with X, have to be some old Greek or something. <laughs> A ship's bottom, um, so that it doesn't get desiccated, I said. <laughs> And I feel, in a sort of peculiar way, it's just chemically sounding enough to be that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I might take a gaziston from Mr. Amos. You're choosing that, are you? Yes. Right. Kingsley, <laughs> true or bluff? <laughs> no. <Ooh. laughs> we had no um, idea. We had no idea. Oh, it's, wasn't chemicals. Oh, it's a what was it? True definition. Here it comes. Charging. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so 
sort of sword, lance, pike, that kind of thing, carried by Greeks, fighting other Greeks. Capelin at this exciting three-all stage, and Patrick is going to define it. The capelin is a small fish. It could be described as a sickly sardine, really, <laughs> because it's sardine size, but even when it's healthy, it's got a kind of greenish phosphorescence. That turns the stomach of the observer and, and of the eater <laughs> and the hearer. But just a moment, please, this is my work. My <laughs> <laughs> it does not, however, sicken other fish. They munch it like mad, particularly if they're fastened onto hooks. <laughs> Off the coast of Newfoundland. <laughs> right. Anton, your go. Well, Capelin is um, the word used for a certain type of drinking vessel which was used in um, the 17th century in France and there were two varieties. One was a very fine leather for this bottle, like a collapsible bottle and that was for the nobility and the other sort was of the uh, heavier leather which we, was used for the peasants. That obviously was more difficult to fold. But in fact, a capelin is a collapsible drinking vessel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the Ancelento? Well, a capelin was an impromptu kicking up of the leg during a dance. And it wasn't very, it was quite frowned upon because energetic capillaries could cause havoc on the dance floor and especially performed by people who had you know big boots on or wasn't very favored <laughs> it'd be pretty awkward really it's small disagreeable fish it's kind of caper you cut sometimes it boots on sometimes not on a dance floor and it's what leather bottles that fold it up uh, well, I don't know whether they're leather, but bottles that could fold up, that made of a substance, uh, that. So, your choice, Frank. Does it have to be? <coughs> yes, I'm afraid so. Well, yeah. it can't be Paddy's stinking fish, can it? <laughs> uh, collapsible drinking vessel, it sounds great fun, doesn't it? Why would it be in the English dictionary, one asks oneself? Um, being kicked in the back of the neck by a partner's boot <laughs> during a, a dance is also... I think it's Paddy's fish. Think it's a fish? Patrick certainly said it. Now he has to tell it. Oh. True or bluff? I always pick the rubbishy ones and they're always Patrick and always wrong. Well done. Ah. <laughs> it's that awful fish you were talking about. Absolutely true. Little, tiny, green... Nauseous fish. Three, four. And jipper or gipper is the next word. Frank Muir. I don't really know. I know what the word means. I don't know whether it's jipper or gipper. Probably gipper. Paddy probably knows the word. It's, um, it's a twist or kink in a hemp and rope. Um, I would like to add to that. Not too much, Frank. No, no, no. <laughs> I only mean because of no, time. No, if, if, if you coil a rope anti-clockwise, it's much less likely to get a gipper in it. Okay. Thought, next. Kink or thing in a rope? Kinkly. Uh, a jipper is a cutting tool that's wielded by a herring cutter. Well, you could small, sharp oh, knife. Oh, Yes, uh, with which in two quick movements a dead herring becomes firstly headless and secondly gutless. Mm -hmm. Haley. A, a, a jipper is an Americanism for a citizen of Minneapolis. The nickname derives from Jip, G-I-P, meaning an animal's fur. Many of the original Minneapoliticians yes. being well, traders well said, well said. in Jips. So it's um, a citizen of uh, Minneapolis. It's a twist or kink in a rope, and it's a knife for gutting herrings. Patrick. A choice. Do I have around about a quarter of an hour? To no, about, I should say, 12 and a half seconds. <laughs> oh, what did you bring it there? It can't be a herring gutter. Uh, 
It doesn't matter if you lay a rope up, as we say, we sailors say, lay a rope up left hand or right hand. Do you? Yeah, we, we say that all the time. I'm going to get you to plump in a minute. <laughs> well, I'm going, to, I, I'm going to choose, not, not that bit of the word. All that nonsense that Haley had. Citizen of Minneapolis. Minneapolis. True or bluff, Haley, very quickly, if you please. Quick, quick. <gasps> it's a bluff, isn't it? It's a bluff. Oh. Oh. And very quickly, the true definition. It is indeed. It was indeed the uh, the herring gutter. So the score five three. Frank Muir's team has won. We shall make that. Another trip to the uh, waxworks of the English language next week. Until then, goodbye from Anton Rogers, <laughs> Kingsley Amis, the Ancelento, Hayley Bill, Catherine Campbell, <laughs> Frank York, <laughs> and goodbye. It's Call My Bluff again with the Webster booth of the panel game, Frank Muir. <laughs> My first guest hasn't been on this programme before, but she's been on television, and she won an award for playing the lead in the play Spend, 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 and she is a national theatre player, and she is Susan Littler. My next guest is a musician. He composes music and he talks about it and he writes about it. And he is Anthony Hopkins. And at room temperature, Patrick Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my... First guest's father, not the real father, he's got a very murky history. He's, he's on a barker, you see, but he's going straight now with his lovely daughter, Patricia Brick. <laughs> and my other guest is a kind of thug. He's arrived with his own sandbag, but he's from the sandbag, isn't he? Roy Marsden. <laughs> So, those are the people, here are the words, or at least the first one, um, pronounce it as you will. Succurath, I would think. What's going to happen is that Frank Muir and his team are going to define succurath three different ways. Two are false, one is true, that's the one that Patrick and company try to pick out. So, off you go, Frank. Succurath, do you think? Or sucker, I don't know how to pronounce it. Succurath <laughs> <coughs> is, as the name so laughingly clearly suggests, is a gemstone found on the island of Malta. It's in Hatton Gardens and amongst chaps who know all, all about gems. It's called the Shaded Garnet. Bacar's bright light makes it go sort of darker. Isn't it? <laughs> or not. Or not, yes. Not a very showy start. Let's see what comes <coughs> next. A Anthony Hopkins. Uh, a succorath. I'm delighted to have the chance of defining because I'm very fond of monsters. I love to think about things like the Loch Ness Monster and so on. And uh, a Sakharath is not a monster that one would find in Loch Ness. It's a land monster, last sighted in Patagonia in 1688. I'm afraid I don't know the exact month. Um, the particular close encounter with this monster uh, leaves us with a description of it insofar as it says that it galloped away and put its young on its back. But we don't know anything more about it than that. It's a monster from Patagonia. OK. Now, Susan Littler. 
A sakarath is a soothing lullaby with which Persian mothers croon their children to sleep. Now, the words of many sakarath are traditional, but the tunes and melodies are not. These are left to the musical invention of the mother. Okay, so you have um, a Maltese precious stone, a fabulous beast, or at least a beast no one ever saw after that particular date, and uh, a Persian, not a Norfolk, a Persian lullaby. Patrick. Yes, well, we had a little consultation. She said, I couldn't hear what she was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that Anthony Hopkins knows what the Patagonian national language is because there's no language which is called Patagonian, is there? Don't answer. <laughs> Who's speaking? Disregard. Who's going to get into the Oxford Dictionary if all the way from Patagonia to runny away monsters? M monsters. Even a Persian mother making up her own tune seems to me. To, your turn will come in a minute. You might. I don't believe mummies ever make up tunes. They, they sing the old stuff. But it's all deeply reasoned, isn't it? <laughs> Nice and thoughtful, yeah. I think Malt is only covered with sand. <laughs> but I still think it's a, <coughs> it's a monster. You think it's the monster now? I it don't. was um, Anthony, yes. Two or bluff is that? Um, can't read it from here. Thank you. Ah. Oh. 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 Right. Right. Um, a Sukhiroth, or Rath, I should say, is um, a, a beast from Patagonia, reportedly, anyway. Clog, clogged. <laughs> Sounds like a compliment, doesn't it? Clogged um, is the next word. Patrick. A cloghead Patrick is very nice. <laughs> I would imagine that, that English or British people would call this cloghead. In fact, it's an Irish word, which is pronounced floppity. It's a ninth, a ninth century little tower with a domed roof on it. Ninth century. Found on the west coast of Ireland between Galway and Kinsale. Now, just a minute. <laughs> Would you like to have the Irish no, spelling? No, no. <laughs> Can't do without it. C L O G A C H D E. Pronounced? Clobbered. Ah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Splendid. So now, Roy Marsden. Cloghead. It's a ship's fitting. It's uh, made of steel, stainless steel, and it's for attaching a cable, hawser, warp, to the bows of a ship. It's made of a steel forging. It has a circular ring and it has two fixings on either side. That's a clock yet. Right, nothing fancy there. Patricia, break your turn. Well, a cloghead is the least able member of a Skittles team. So, uh, <laughs> he usually plays first, you see, so he's got the most Skittles to aim at. And then he's relegated to picking up all the Skittles that his fellow members have bowled over. That's a clogged. All fit together. It's a round stone tower in Ireland. It's a poor skittle player, always goes first, and it's a steel ring let into a ship so you can tie it up to something. Frank. Oh, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little, little complaint. Pass? Pass. Yes. Uh, um, very interesting, very interesting. Another little incursion into Irish mythology. Ship's fitting clog head is a bit too simple, isn't it? It would be very disappointing if it was true, because it, <laughs> it uh, just it sounds like a clockhead, doesn't it? Um, a skittle team, I don't think you'd call the clockhead. You couldn't say, you're clockhead tonight. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd say, well, I'm not, I'm not turning up then. <laughs> <laughs> and my skittles, too. Uh, so I think it's, it can't be Paddy's rubbish, can it? Oh, yes, go on. Flash the card. You think it's, it's Patrick? A, it's a ninth said century small tower called Round. Clough. That's right. <laughs> no. And he gave us a pronunciation too. Patrick, true or bluff? It's true. <laughs> well, 
always thought, I, I think all the towns in Galway begin with um, CLOG or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, well. It, including Castle V, which isn't in Galway anyway. No, no. no. And spelt differently altogether. <laughs> uh, Mewling's the next one. One all, and we have Mewling. Anthony Hopkins. I'm a bit out of my depth this one because it's to do with guns, and I really don't know much about them, but Mewling is a form of gun maker's embellishment on the barrel of a musket. And if you could watch me at this point, because oh. it's how you look at a gun end on that matters. The barrel is hammered into a number of longitudinal faces, eight of them. So instead of being a circle like that when you look at it, it's a sort of eight-sided thing, but I can't do an eight-sided thing with my thumb and finger. I should hope not. Yeah. <laughs> and now, uh, Susan, your turn. It's a little-known fact. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> that given the right encouragement, a canary can be persuaded to breed with a goldfish. Goldfish? Yes, a goldfish. Now this... Finn. A canary? A goldfish! <laughs> that would be a little known fact. Now this actual... <laughs> ...process of cross-breeding... <laughs> Let him get on with it. This actual process of cross-breeding is known to the... Uh, bird-loving fraternity, of which I am not one, <laughs> as <coughs> mewling. Well, remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> Flying <Right>. fish. Yes. <laughs> Frank? Oh. Uh, would you believe, <laughs> alternatively, um, Oi, uh, we ain't no money, oh, hey, they don't pay my bills. It's a, a, a deputation of tradespersons. Who, who have something to complain about. Uh, a muling was, for instance, in 1587, there was a muling of tradespersons in the town of Nottingham who presented a petition griping about their conditions and non-payment of bills to Hatfield House. It's still there. Right. Both London, Hatfield House uh, and the... enough, it's all right. <laughs> Bunch of... Furthermore... Oh! <laughs> a little more about Nottingham, shall we have, yes. Are oh, you not going to say anymore? No, no, no. Oh, you put me off. just teasing me. Um, it's a bunch of dissatisfied shopkeepers, sometimes in Nottingham, sometimes otherwhere. It's a musket shaped with eight... Octangular, I suppose. Octagonal, I think I mean. And I thought she was going to say it's a little-known fact, but she didn't. She went on to say it was cross-breeding in birds, as I grasped it. Um, Roy, your turn. It's the embellishment on guns. Hmm. It doesn't seem quite right, does it? And, of course, Frank twinkles all the time, so you can never believe him. Is that what he does? Uh, I've <laughs> that's sneering. <laughs> <laughs> it's sneers, isn't it? And the flying fish, yes. Mm. No, I can't believe it's there. Mind you, mewling and puking. Yep. <laughs> Mewling, yes. Wasn't that bad? No, 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 no. Two performance, no. Yes, I do think it's Frank. It must be. It must yeah. be this collection in 1587. The bunch of um, outraged shopkeepers. True or bluff, Frank? It's true, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, it, it isn't. isn't. <laughs> No, no. All rubbish, that. Who gave the true one? Oh. <laughs> so there you are. Mewling is a little-known fact. I mean, it's cross-breeding among uh, birds. A bursu is the next word. Roy Marsden. Bursu. It's a cookery dish. It's ancient. It's English. And it's a, a casserole of uh, pig's entrails. Oh, charming. Uh, there is a, a recipe for it, an ancient recipe. It's uh, take ye numbers of ye swine and parboil them in blood and wine. That's the recipe for <laughs> bursu, a casserole. Not a lot of it about these days. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia, your turn. Well, a bursu was a small flag or a pennant which uh, identified a competitor in a jousting competition. And it was carried on a pole by a groom or a serf. And then uh, if, in fact, the knight lost, 
the pole would be symbolically snapped in half. That's what a bursi was. Mm-hmm. To obey, right, Patrick? Bursu doesn't often appear in the singular. It's fairly dull unless I am talking about it, or <laughs> at the same time, a whole bunch of the South Dorsetshire miners. The, you know, the, the, I, I don't mean miners, a bigger part, I mean quarry workers. It, 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 kind of quite different to miners, isn't it? Mm. You'll allow me that, yes. Well, when they're digging away in quarries in South Dorsetshire, and they find lots of bursues, little f fossilized fish or fossilized fosh, like <laughs> Susan got last time. That's what bursues, mostly bursues. I look at find only one fossil, for heaven's sake, in a, in a limestone fosh. quarry in South Dorsetshire. Are you? Yeah. No. Yeah, well, fossils, really, generally, yeah. on the whole. It's a casserole, also pigs' uh, insides, and it's a pennant flown by knights in a tournament. Anthony. Um, didn't like the recipe, uh, all that blood and stuff. I'm very sceptical, having watched this programme on innumerable occasions, of anything in rhyme. It's invariably misleading. Um, the flag, the pennant, I think that's a deliberate attempt to confuse the issue by dragging in the word burgee, which is what you're actually thinking of. Um, by unanimous vote, and with my captain's consent, therefore he can take the blame if I'm wrong, we're going to go for the fossilised fish. Fossilised fish of whom or of which Patrick spoke to? You've got a right clog head there. <laughs> no. yes, yes. Oh. That wasn't right. That wasn't right. Got to be one of the others. Who is it? Here it comes. Oh, do you? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. Yes, that is good. Very much for the recipe. It's in the wrong. That dreadful casserole. That's what a bursu is. And now we have the word stopsel. And Susan, it's your go. <clears throat> the upper sole. The upper pad of the sole of a foxhound's foot. This is what this is. And it's subject to a lot of wear and tear, as you can imagine, in the hunting season. <laughs> and it can be artificially hardened by soaking it in a mixture of alum and water. That's told him. Put it squarely before them. Hang uh, now it's you, Frank. <coughs> well, it, you're an army, you see, in the 16th century. And they're all coming at you, the other lot. How are you going to hold them back? I mean, you could jab at them with your pikes. But if you could do something really nasty to them, so they break ranks and everything. So some bright lad, he said, let's make a stopsel. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big, big ball of pitch and stuff like that, you see. Sulfur. You roll it all up and you put it in a huge great catapult you light it and he goes vroom you see and goes into the army it's a riot here oh, what's that <laughs> and, then, uh, and it demoralized them and they scattered and uh, it was a, a, a very offensive weapon in the 16th century mm -hmm. right um, Anthony you'll go again um, most of us have seen a piano tuner at work but not all of us have the privilege of seeing an organ tuner at work and he has all those pipes that he has to bring into perfect pitch, and he normally hammers the top of them with a little tin hammer all round the edge like that. But if it's got to have a lot of tuning done to it, he has some little wooden discs, which are called stopsels, and he, he drops them in, and this narrows or changes the gauge of the pipe so as to change its pitch. The stopsel is a wooden disc that you drop into an organ pipe. Mm. Well, it's a kind of weapon, a ball of sulphur and um, lots of other pitch, I think you said. Part of a hound's foot, and it's a sort of thing you put into an organ pipe if you don't like the way it sounds before you put it in. But Patricia? Mm. Oh, uh, yes. difficult, difficult. Uh, I don't know, Anthony's definition is, is, it's awfully hard not to believe it, but somehow I don't. It just sounds much too reasonable and kind of right. And uh, Frank's definition is... Wonderful, I enjoyed every minute of it, but I didn't quite believe it, you, not really. Don't ask me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Ask you. <laughs> and I think, I think perhaps it's Susan's definition, it's the, 
It sounds so ridiculous. The same. You're leaving out Frank. You, you. No, uh, I said no. I said I thought Frank. I said. Oh, of course you had. I thought Frank. Do pay attention. Frank's definitely smashed. But I didn't believe it. Not enough for a minute there. It's going to prove me wrong now. So I think I think it's Susan's hand's foot. The hand's foot. You did speak of that, didn't you, Susan? Now you must own up. True or blood. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can't do with that. Let's have uh, the real one. Let's see it, Frank. It must be there. It what? It is. Oh. <laughs> you men. It's a sort of kind of early cannonball. You set fire to and um, scatter the foe. So, shower is the next word, and Patricia Brake, your turn. Well, in darkest Somerset, our mothers are always uh, showering at their children. Uh, and you'll find that Somerset farmers, they chower about the weather and they chower about the price of pigs. Because, in fact, it's a Somerset verb, which means to scold, to chide. That's what it is. Right enough. Now, Patrick's turn. A chower? Right about the 19, mm, early 20s in Canada, among the lumberjacks, was a saw, a two-handed saw, and called a char for the very, very good reason that the name of the manufacturer of said saw was C.H. Hour. <laughs> they used to say, I'm not very good on Canadian dialect or accent, have you got my char? I mean, lumberjacks, we just talk like that a little bit. <laughs> but that's what they were on about, two-handed saw. And now, Roy Marsden. Chower. Anglo-Indian word, used mostly, of course, during the British Raj. It's an abbreviation of the word chower walla. Chower walla was the <laughs> lowliest member of the Indian household. It was him who, uh, he was a sort of apprentice, and it was his job to uh, do all the menial things that the other servants wouldn't do. And, you know, he was the apprentice punkawalla, if you like. Or he picked the flies off the master's fly whisk. <laughs> all right, so it's a Canadian saw invented by a fellow called C.H. Hour, an Indian servant, and um, a verb in Somerset to mean means chide or scold. Susan Littler. Just confirmed. That's all right. <laughs> More or less any time in the next two seconds. Just, right. Just pay for inspiration. Yes, inspiration. Yeah, I don't actually one. believe any of them. <laughs> no, but really. one is true. Yeah. The Somerset, I don't know. I've never heard of that. Chower. No, I don't really believe that. Was there something about lumberjack? C H O. The saw. Oh, yes, the saw. Mm, yeah. I don't know. It could be that, but. <clears throat> I think it's the member of the Indian household. You do. Now that that was uh, Roy Marsden, wasn't it? Roy Marsden, true or bluff? <sighs> oh no! <laughs> Let's try again and find the true definition. Here it comes. Oh no! It, it was. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Could you believe it? <laughs> Once an old Somerset uh, piece of demotic is true. And now, three all, interesting moment, cyclone is the next one. Uh, Frank. Oh. Snuff trouble. Um, late Victorian cyclist. <laughs> Peddling. And wants to go oink oink. <laughs> you see, what does he or she, Daisy Bell, say? What does Daisy Bell actually go oink oink on? A cyclone. <laughs> which was, which, no, no, it was, it was a vogue word of the period of a combination of two words. Now, any boy, to uh, cycle and horn. And you pressed the rubber bulb and you went oink oink. And geese and things got out of the way of the cycle. <laughs> it's a Victor late Victorian word for the bulb 
cycle horn on a cycle. Uh, right. So now, <laughs> oh, Anthony yeah. Hopkins. Um, cyclone, actually. Cyclone is one of these rather difficult heraldic words. It defines the sort of line that divides a shield into two or even more segments. If it's a zigzag shape, which I expect you've often seen on carvings or paintings of heraldic nature, or a sequence of dovetails, for example, that would be called a cyclone by the people who know, but not by those who don't. How could they if they didn't know it? That's the well, that's why they wouldn't use the word. Uh, good point, yes. Susan. A cyclone is a glass lens with two convex surfaces, rather like a thick monocle. It used to be used by ancient physicians for cauterizing wounds, for concentrating the sun's rays onto an open wound. <laughs> right. And thereby stopping a oh, hemorrhage. Oh, a little more, a little more. Thereby stopping a hemorrhage. Well, it would, really. Almost it would. If, <laughs> immediately. If the sun was out, I suppose, yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's a <laughs> name of a horn on a bike. It's a lens through which they did that th thing that she said, and a, an heraldic device, a line drawn uh, on a shield. Patrick, your choice. Seeing that all the words connected with the heraldry are so silly, you can't believe them, even if they're true. <coughs> That doesn't feel like a heraldic word. They're all odder than that, I think. Have you got a true or a bluff there, Anthony? They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they don't the all the bulbs on bicycles or a thick monocle to concentrate. It's all such miserable drivel. <laughs> <laughs> I think whatever you describe as a vogue word might have some connection with cyclone. Your or am I absolutely convinced? I think <laughs> I am, yes. Make up your mind, lad. Yes. You will. You, you choose the cyclone uh, that uh, Frank spoke of, to or bluff. It's a bluff. I'm going to give Patty a chance to change his mind. That's fairly sporting, Isn't it? obviously. It's Look. tempting. No, no, then. <laughs> it's a bluff, isn't it? Mm. No, no. <laughs> Imagine our word like cycle got into any dictionary. But there you are. Truth is stranger than fiction, sometimes. Diamoron is the next one. So, Patrick. A diamoron? <laughs> Would you care to listen to me for a moment? I'm so sorry. A diamoron, which is really called, <laughs> is a mating of volcanoes. This might seem to you to be impossible. Unpleasant. But long before, long before the volcanoes got up above the world's surface, they have mated down below, <laughs> millions of miles around the middle of the world. You get a huge bunch of lava trying to get out, and it bifurcates. You know what bifurcate means? And it pops up in volcanoes that might be a thousand miles apart. After a diamond, <coughs> I forgot what diamond is. It's a, a it's mating a, of volcanoes in the, middle of the, in the middle of the earth. This must not be the right one. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a second. We've got a couple more. Roy Marsden tells you another now. Diamoran. It's a medicine. It's ancient Greek. It's made of, usually that is, black mulberries and sugar, or honey, sugared water. And it's used for... Soothing the throat um, for sore throats or hoarseness. For gargling, a gargle, an ancient Greek gargle. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, Patricia tells you a thing. Well, uh, a diamond is guaranteed to wake a soundly sleeping soldier. It's, in fact, a sort of double revali, uh, played by two. It's a trumpeter to tootling on a trumpet, and a drummer rubber dub dubbing on a drum. That's a diamond. Okay, so it's that kind of uh, rather extravagant revali. It's um, a remedy, a Greek remedy for a sore, th a gargle, I think, for a sore throat and that kind of thing. And this mysterious mating of the volcanoes <laughs> underground. Your choice, Frank. 
Um, <laughs> mummy. Wait. Come on, Mira, get onto it. Um, not a gargle. Uh, definitely not a gargle. Who said a gargle? I said a gargle. Oh, it's you with your Richard recipes, isn't it? No, it's not, it's not a... No, lad, sorry, it's not a gargle. Um, it's not a... Oh, God. It, it's... Um, don't think it's uh, drums. I think it must be Paddy's mating volcanoes. <laughs> He's going to have to own up quickly. Time is running out. Show us. True or bluff? It's just a plain bluff, really. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes a true one, the very last true one on this occasion. Here it is. Oh, he's got it. He's got it. He knows it now. Thank you. Bit of a gargle for a sore throat. Greek, of course. Now the score standing at five three. I declare Patrick's team has won. More words with square wheels from the Oxford English Dictionary next week. Till then, goodbye from Anthony Hopkins. Roy Marsden. Susan Dickler. Patricia Brake. Good night. Good night. Patrick Campbell. Good night. And goodbye. My Bluff Television's answer to Spillikins, which features Patrick Campbell. After a well deserved victory uh, last week, which is not abnormal, it's a great pleasure to welcome back Patricia Brake. And I have my usual brain packed in ice here, the well-known spy master from Sandbaggers, Roy Marsden. <laughs> and Baron Munchausen, alias Frank Muir. <laughs> I, of course, have the same team, winners of the silver medal at the last week <laughs> for the world of theatre, Susan Littler. And from music, Anthony Hopkins. Right, let's try. And if we ring, we get a word. And that word is letiga, or they may pronounce it um, any other way. But what's going to happen, as you may remember, Patrick Campbell and his team will define letiga three different ways. Two are false, two are the definitions. One is true. That's the one that Frank and his people try and pick out. So what of this word, Patrick? Letica is connected with oral hygiene mm. because letica <laughs> is the fungus that grows on the tartar that gets stuck between people's teeth. <laughs> Scrub away as you might, you're going to leave a little bit of letica behind, which, seen through a microscope, it looks like ice green crystals. Well, very, very small. Once you might, not huge lumps of ice stuck around the tartan. No, no. That's what it is. Well, we're off to a joyful start. <laughs> Roy Marsden. Lettiger. It's a form of carriage. It's a sort of double sedan chair. Um, it's a posh form of travel. It's usually pulled by uh, a donkey, asses, mules. Uh, the novel form is that the people can sit facing each other, one to one, either men to men, women to women, or how you will. It's um, intimate, but slow. <laughs> Let it go. Nationality. Don't answer. That's his trouble. Doesn't oh. have to say. Doesn't have to say if he doesn't want to. Your witness. Patricia, <laughs> Patricia break. Uh, Letiger is a 
greyish white fur, which in fact uh, originally belonged to a weasel or a polecat, and uh, then uh, was used to trim. As far as I know, in fact, it was used. I mean, whether it still is, I don't know. That I don't know. But it was used to trim the ceremonial robes of people like the, the doorkeeper or other minor officials at the Vatican. Let it go. Sort of fur, then. Sort of fur. Kind of um, sedan chair driven by mules and uh, that stuff that grows on your... Fungus that grows on your teeth. Frank. Your teeth. Right, right, thank you. Stand by lads at the back, one this side. Um, <laughs> not a carriage, can't be a carriage drawn by a bullock. I haven't had bullocks in this country for years. Um, also, it's a foreign sounding word, isn't it? Um, stuff on teeth, uh, grey fur on teeth. No, grey fur on, <laughs> on popes, isn't it? Um, <laughs> No, it's, 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 it's Paddy's rotten stuff that does in your teeth. Stuff on the teeth, he said, looked like ice crystals, coloured green and all that. True or bluff? What a jolly story. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that? I suppose that's got to be called something, but it's not called that. Um, who gave the true definition? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, it was They've got it here. They'll show you in a minute. You don't oh, yes, <laughs> Yeah, kind of through. double sedan chair it was. Uh, Sabosco is the next word, and Frank Muir will define it. Sabosco is, I suppose you would say, an office, really, or, or an official. And faintly surprisingly, it's the office of the nun in charge of the wine <laughs> in a convent. Somebody has got to be in charge of the wine. Convents have got to have wine. The person in charge of it has got to have a title. And Sabasco was the title given to the uh, a rather sort of lowly nun who looked after the wine bottles, bottles of wine. I have nothing to add to what I said in the house. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see what um, Anthony Hopkins says. Um, I've never actually grown a beard, seriously. But for one period, <laughs> one period of my life, I was flat on my back for about three weeks, and I couldn't shave. And so I had this little beard, which in fact made me look rather like Claude Debussy in an early photograph. But my friends reckoned it didn't suit me all that well, and they used to tease me about it. And indeed, people who have beards do get teased about having beards. I believe it's sort of jokey names like face fungus and that sort of thing. Um, but had it been in the 16th century that I had grown my beard, they would have said, that's a nice bit of Sabosco you've got there, <laughs> wouldn't it? Uh, it's sort of jokey name for a beard, um, 16th century derivation, that sort of thing. And now Susan Littler. A Sabosco is part of the anatomy of a very grand four-poster bed. It is the name of the curtain, the inner curtain, which is made of a semi-transparent material which can be drawn during the day and filter out the harsh rays of the sun and give a more <clears throat> restful, romantic ambience. Right. All right. Sort of inner curtain on one of those four poster beds. It's a sort of cant term for a man's whiskers and it's a nun who looks after the wine. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> It's scarcely worth my while applying myself to this. It's all so silly. Uh, could I change my definition? No, no, no. <laughs> You're doomed, you see. But anyone that believes he can he begin to grow a beard seriously is mad. Well, you can't How grow can you grow a beard frivolously? <laughs> Out of court, Frank, you've got a good connection with nuns, don't you? I know about some of your relations. <laughs> They're all nuns. And all side. that drivel about four poster beds getting nice just quick. It's a wine looking after nun. It's a nun who, keep, who looks after the wine. Well, you did say it, Frank. True or bluff? He'll tell you now. It's a bluff, isn't it? Yeah. Is he believing that? <laughs> I 
What's your bank is on Venice? Well, I don't know who does look after the wine in a convent, but um, it's uh, no, not a Sabosco. Who gave yeah. the two definition? Here he comes. Um, I think oh. it's uh, the, the beer. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of cheering um, name for a man's uh, whiskers. The beer. game's got even better suddenly. Now, one all, yes. Very exciting at a very early stage. Grieshoff is the next word. No. Roy Marsden. It's an Icelandic word. It's pronounced Grieshoff. And it's the name for an Icelandic poppy. It's a miniature poppy and it's usually found growing on the slopes of uh, Mount Hekla. It's not a very pretty flower. It's mostly famous for the fact that it has uh, its property, its juice, is, is used to prevent frostbite in Icelandic fishermen. Grishok, an Icelandic poppy. Right. Patricia? Grishok is a variety of Flemish butter. It's unsalted and it's got a very low fat content. And this makes it very popular for sculpting um, swans to decorate, to decorate uh, state banquets, because, in fact, it has a, a very high melting point. Or should I say low melting point? But if, whatever it is, it actually takes a long time to melt. <laughs> um, now, uh, <laughs> leave that to simmer. <laughs> I'd like to take as my text a moving quotation from the unreadable works of the late Sir Walter Scott who once said, mm. I'm not very good at Walter Scott dialect, you see. Gang, I think he said, a moment. Gang up to your beds, sirs, and dinner put out the green shock. <laughs> he would not have any reference to a dog, but to the embers in the peat fire. Now, it, that should be called a turf fire, because peat, and the English people say in Ireland, it doesn't matter, <laughs> I haven't finished yet. Isn't there a heavenly smell of peat? We always say, peat who? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you would. It's a bit about dinner putting out the... Uh, I see what you meant. I see what you meant. It's not dinner that puts out the peat fire. <laughs> Do not. It's the embers, the bit that, uh, uh, that at the end of a peat fire. It's Flemish butter made into swans as often as not, and it's an Iceland poppy. Um, Anthony, your choice. That'll be the other one. Yes. It's Icelandic antifreeze. Uh, it didn't take much of a fancy to, really, because I'm sure that Icelandic words don't end with O-C-H. I don't know why I'm sure of it, but I am sure. Um, the Flemish butter, the sculpting swans. I don't know particularly why there should be swans. Um, she got a bit tied up with a high and low melting point, and she's not supposed to tell a lie if it's true, so therefore I think that's probably the one. Gang out your bed, sirs, and dinner put out the grease hook is the most improbable quotation from Sir Walter Scott that I've ever heard, <laughs> even on this programme, to which I'm a devoted watcher. Now, I will go for the Flemish butter and the swan sculpture. The Flemish butter, the high or low melting point. Now, that was you, wasn't it, Patricia? It was. It was. Sure, bluff. She looks a bit pleased. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see who gave the true definition. Can you I believe it? I do have never read a a word of some water. The other day I cast doubt on the quotations used in the true definitions in this prayer. They all sounded bogus as a three-bob note to me, but they're all genuine. So that was Walter Scott. Blimey. So here we have the word stropper. Um, and Anthony Hopkins, your go. Oh, um, a, a stropper sort of things you might well find in that programme about the vets on the telly, you know, all creatures great and small, the sort of thing they call out Timothy to cope with, because it's a cow... No, it's not Timothy, is it? He's James. It's Timothy who plays it. Yeah, they... they... <laughs> no, 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 sorry. It's a cow um, who falls behind on the production line, not giving the adequate yield of milk, the sort of thing... Um, let's suppose it's Buttercup or Primrose or something, it's the name of the cow, and one week she only gives five gallons instead of six. Well, uh, Jack comes along and says, Ah, she's been a proper stropper this week. <laughs> Who's Jack? <laughs> 
now, just a minute. Don't mess us around. Jack is Jack Grummet. He's the head cummer. <laughs> 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 That's right. He's a very well-known character in Walter Scott, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, um, Susan, your go. A scropper could be used as a paper knife. It's a flattish instrument, usually made of ivory, wood, or bone. But in fact, the proper use is it's an implement for making sure that mm -hmm. all the ruffles mm -hmm. on the ruff are perfectly even and symmetrical. That's what a stropper is. Well, yes, right. Frank, your turn. Battle of Cressy. <laughs> Sarge, Sarge, I broke my arm. <laughs> So what, what does the sergeant do? I'm not even sure they had doctors in those days. What does the sergeant do? Anyway, what the sergeant does is he calls somebody and they apply a stopper. In fact, it's a verb to, to, to stopper, which is to bind up the, the break with um, a sort of leathern, wide leathern thong. They didn't use hard splints. It was a soft bind, but it was all they had at the Battle of Cressy. <laughs> and lucky to get it too. Anyway, it's it's a kind of a soft split. It's something you shape a, a rough with, and it's a very poor yielding cow. Roy, your turn. I haven't a clue. Excuse me. Um, yes. Could you help me? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> right. Yes. A ruffle. Waffler. Doer. Doer. What's it No, stropper. Stropper. Mm. Stropper. Battle of Cressy. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. Soft splitting. No, it can't possibly be that. But we come back to Jack Grummet. <laughs> yes. Jack Grummet. Oh. Noble Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Noble Jack Grummet. Yes, I think it must be that. It's a cow that's uh, lapsed on the milk. That's what um, Anthony Hopkins said. Mm, now he has to own yeah, it. Yeah. Well, Jack gets a bonus. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's a poor yielding cow belonging to old Jack Grummet. <laughs> or not, in case may be. Ligdor is the next one. Patricia Brick. Well, Ligdor is a, a rather rare variety of honeysuckle that grows on the North African coast. And it had a very strange reputation in medieval times because it was thought that uh, if you actually chewed the leaves of the Ligdor, uh, it would provoke hysterical well, almost hysterical, uncontrollable laughter. Ligdor. We could do with a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> a few springs. If you hadn't have said it, I might have done. Yep, Patrick. Sorry. <laughs> Ligdor was a 18th century explosive, much used in the mines of Silesia. A lot of money was going on there. <laughs> It was a kind of uh, difficult to explain, really. Well, don't try. <laughs> I thought I was shot at it. If you cut down an oak tree, you get a lot of sawdust. Oh, all right, right. You put the tree on one side, the sawdust on this side, and mix it with a kind of, a kind of early nitroglycerine, and it made a glorious bang in a mine in Silesia. I just wonder why you had to mix it with the sawdust, but then, you know, I've got, I've got to wonder something. It gives a bigger something. bang. What? It makes it better, that way. Bigger bang. Yeah. Well, there you are. Roy, you're dirty. Not a bigger bong. It's not a bigger bong. <laughs> Ligda. It's the name of an ecclesiastical garment worn by a bishop, but his, it's his walking out, part of his walking out gear. Uh, he would wear it parading. It's part of the lower garments. It's the name given to the gaiters, but to the long ones that reach from well above the knee down to the ankle rather than spats or anything. Uh, you see them with all those buttons all the way down the sides. Perhaps they've got zips now, but uh, buttons. That's Ligdor. Sort of wild honeysuckle, it was said. Bishop's gaiter and 18th century explosive part nitroglycerine, part sawdust. Susan. Can I just confirm? No point in talking to him, <laughs> well. I don't think it is the explosion. I did until you said it was a huge bang. I don't see why it's got to be huge. I don't know. I don't quite believe that. I'm with you. Do you agree? <laughs> yes. 
Yes. Think. Now the garter. No, Not I don't know garter, why. A gaiter. A gaiter. A gaiter. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a garment, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm not going to go for that. No, I'm going to go for the honeysuckle. I like the sound of hysterical laughter. Honeysuckle <laughs> spoken of by Patricia Brick. My true honeysuckle or not? Honeysuckle the bee. Oh, no. Oh, no. None of that. Who gave the true definition? It's coming up. What else would a bishop's gaiter be called? Anybody's gaiter. And that's what it is called, a lictor. Dwam is the next word. Susan Littler. Actually, it's pronounced dwarm. And a dwarm was a passport which was issued to accredited agents of the East India Company. Now, <clears throat> if you go to Ipswich, you may visit the Clive Museum. Because there was a man called Robert Clive, who was a junior member of that company, and in fact his dwarm can be seen there in Ipswich. <laughs> <laughs> Frank. Mm. If you proceed to Scotland, and you see a Scot lying on pavement. He could be suffering from a dwam. <laughs> it is, you know, it is, <laughs> because it's, it's a, a, a he, he's in a state of stunned stupefaction. But not. I hesitate. I don't hesitate to <laughs> not, I, I hurry to say, not a question of alcoholic stupefaction at all. A dwam is a kind of a sudden come over that, that Scots are liable to come over. They've got it permanently, haven't they? No. No. It's a, it's a very, very great nation. Have you finished? I'm prepared to stop. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins now tells you. Um, if Gypsy Rose Lee yonder would lend me her thing that she's wearing. Frank, could I borrow your handkerchief for a moment? I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the snuff. Well, anyway, it's a, it's, um, it's a sort of cotton thing that Sudanese women wear over their faces, not like a yashmak, because yashmak is for modesty's purpose. This is purely fact functional and factual insofar as it's to keep out the dust when there's a dust storm on and a Sudanese woman not a man wears a dwam to keep the dust out well it's a Scots or Scotch fainting mm. fit it's a part a sort of part special passport and it's kind of mm. a cloak or thing you drape over yourself <laughs> your face to keep the dust out Patricia S the Sudanese dwam no, I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't quite know why I don't think so, but I don't think so. And Frank's dwam. It was very exciting, wasn't it? All, all those different uh, pronunciations. Well, fairly exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Louis dwam. I don't think it's Frank either. I think, in fact, it's the East India Company. I think it's the East Indian passport. The special dwam. passport. Susan Littler. Oh, she pronounced it, didn't she? Did you? Never seen it. Suspense is agony. Who gave the true definition? Here it comes. McHelp. Scotch fainting fit. Thereabouts, anyway. Now we have a goropo, and I invite Patrick Campbell to define it for you. If you get a grapple or you experience a grapple, a grapple, I beg your pardon, <laughs> it might cause you, unless you had nerves of iron, it, it, it makes some kind of outcry like ow or ouch. Now, a trained athlete such as myself, if grappled, <laughs> it can also be a twin to sciatica. Do I ouch? No, no. I soldier on bravely. Little stiff in the leg, too. But a grapple is a twinge, is all. Right. <laughs> Hardly worth it, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Roy Marsden, his turn. A grapple. It's an implement used by the hunt. 
and it's used for retrieving animals, large animals, stags or pigs or whatever, who've got caught in thickets, woodland places where they're inaccessible to men. Uh, and what, the, what it's made of is, is a circular ring of metal attached on one end with a long, thick hawser, and on the other end it has four ropes. Now, these ropes are attached to the legs of the animals that you can get to, and then the whole lot is hauled out. That's mm -hmm. what a grawl is used for. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Patricia, what do you have to tell us? Well, it's on record that on the 4th of March, 1889, varying amounts of grauple fell on different parts of Britain. <laughs> it is, because <laughs> it's actually freezing rain. And it's precipitated moisture, which is too, too hard, in fact, to be called snow, and, and too soft to be called hail. It's grauple. It mainly falls on high ground. Too soft to be called hail, I see. Right, it's a sort of a twinge, kind of a harness for hauling animals out of the deep undergrowth and freezing rain. Frank has his choice. What are you doing? Divine. <laughs> Divine the answer. <laughs> With nothing else to go on. Um, uh, grappling iron for cattle, I think, is a bit much. Uh, splendid though you've been so far, I think it's a bit improbable. So we're, we're torn between freezing rain and I want it to be Paddy's twinge. I want it to be grapple. Can you please oblige Are you me? choosing it, Frank? You I am indeed, oblique. sir. You are a little oblique there. No, I want it to be that. And I'm, I'm Patrick? I will let you have a little look at this with the speed of light. This is another bluff. Oh. Oh. True definition, here it comes. Who could conceivably have had it? L little Patty. <laughs> it is freezing rain. Of course, it would be softer than hail. I just couldn't work it out for a minute, but it's true. Wassel is the next one. Frank. Ah, oh, now Wassel, rather vague Anglo Saxon word for the noises made by nature, or in nature, really. In other words, oi, 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 of a pig, or ah, 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 of a cow. It <laughs> 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 was a very ignorant cow. <laughs> the snoring of dormice. Any sound made by an animal in nature was referred to in early Anglo-Saxon days as a wassail. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins. Oh, um, wassail. We're back with Jack Grummet, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> only he's moved to Northumbria. No. And the trouble is that poor old Jack hasn't got many horses on his farm. In fact, he's got no horses at all. So what does he put on his fields to fertilise them? Well, oh. his farm is fairly near the sea, and so he goes down to the beach each morning and loads up the stems of seaweed. And from them, he makes a vegetable manure. And things grow like fighting cocks or something <laughs> as a result. Um, it's an absolute variety of seaweed exclusive to Northumbria, and its proper name, according to seaweedologists, is Fucus digitatus. <laughs> I'm glad is I got it? that one out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Nip and touch there, isn't it? <laughs> Susan? A wassail is a verb which is very useful to know if ever you're asked to give a commentary on a chariot race. It simply means to overthrow a chariot, as was effectively performed by Charlton Heston <laughs> and Ben Hur. Yeah, so it's too. Uh, upturn, overturn the chariot. Any noise uh, in Anglo-Saxon, well, natural noise sort of thing, it was, it was called a wassail, and it's um, Jack Grummet's uh, adaptable seaweed manure. Patrick. I know a lot about seaweed manure, but not for a kind of family show, anyway. Uh, <laughs> this cow that bleeds. <laughs> Get him on, call my blood. You're assistant. 
there what had a canary making love to a goldfish. <laughs> you don't know anything about anything, especially not animals. Mm. So bleeding, overthrowing Charlotte Heston's chip. Charlotte. Charlotte. <laughs> 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 anyway, she's out. We're all out now. It, plunge. It must be this seaweed. I know a lot about collecting seaweed for fertilizer. That's what it is. Well, ah, well, it was Focus, an... Focus Digital. It was Anthony Focus Hopkins. Digital, yes. I wonder if he was telling the truth. I wonder if I have changed my mind. No. I hate to say it, but he was. <laughs> <laughs> A bit about Jack Grummet was embroidery, though. Oh, yes. was, and, yeah, there must be a Jack Grummet who's used it before, I suppose. Well, yes. Anyway, so there, that's what it means. That was our last word. It means oh, um, vegetable manure. And the score standing at 6 2, uh, Patrick Campbell's team has won. <laughs> We'll see if we can't dredge up a few more 78s from the OED next week. Until then, goodbye from Roy Marsden. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> Patricia Quick. Susan Dixon. Patrick Campbell. Thank you. And goodbye. Welcome you now to Call My Bluff, or as I've, I've got a cutting here, the Jersey Evening Post calls it, Call My Clug. And as you know, as I'm sure you know, Call My Clug is famous for featuring Frank Muir. <laughs> Good evening. The entire team this side of the house are actors except me. And my first actor is the totally delightful Prunella G. My second actor, I'll give you a clue. I, Claudius, he, Derek. It's <laughs> Derek Jacobi. <laughs> and no game of Call My Clug is complete without Patrick Campbell. Mm. Right. Uh, we are all actors on my side as ever. And my first guest is a lovely actress. But she's got a kind of secret instrument about her person. She is none other, when you see her secret instrument, she is none other than the lovely uh, Nanette Newman. <laughs> there is a little something there, who you know who. And my other acting friend and companion is a kind of very nasty man from Belgium <laughs> called Michael Calva. But she can't do with that what someone I know can do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Salvatella is the first word, and as you know, uh, Frank Mioni's team will define Salvatella three different ways. Two of the definitions are false ones. One is true, that's the one that Patrick and co tried to pick out. So, Frank, what are this word? Um, Salvatella is an exclamatory oath, like, blimey. Or cripes. Uh, it is believed by some etymologists to be a sort of deformed, debased version of an Italian oath meaning preserve my bones. Oh dear. <laughs> Salvatella. <laughs> or even Salvatella. <laughs> right. If pressed. <clears throat> yes, yes. <laughs> if pressed to add, I would say that it's mentioned in Weeda. Under two flags. <coughs> Who's under two flags? Weeda. Oh, Weeda. <laughs> well, uh, she's dead, that is. Leave them wanting more, Frank. <laughs> um, Derek Jacobi, your turn. Well, if I were standing closer to you, 
or conversely, you were standing closer to me, I could show you my salvatellas, because I have two of them. <laughs> now, there's nothing abnormal in this. We all have two. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have two. So perhaps you better look at your own. Um, if, you, if you hold your hands out in front of you, on the backs of your hands, you will see two fattish veins, one on the back of each hand. Now, that is your... Patrick has more than one, but most people, <laughs> most people have one fattish vein on the backs of their hands. That is their salvatella. Now, if I were living in bygone days and a doctor wanted to bleed me, he would encourage the leech to sink its fangs into my salvatella where it could get a very good grip and it would get to the blood very quickly and it would lie there sucking away quietly and painlessly in my salvatella. Good. Mm. Such enthusiasm. <laughs> Prunella G. Salvatella is uh, an American variety of the lime tree which produces um, a sort of primitive form of soap. Uh, this is done by boiling the... No, you don't need to boil the leaves, by soaking Thank the leaves heavens. in hot water. Um, if you were a, a Red Indian squaw, you would know all about this and you would make full use of it on washing day. It actually comes out in a frothy lava-like soap from the leaves. Well, then, it's something you get from... Uh this particular kind of lime tree, it's an exclamation or oath, and it's the vein on the back of your hand, the large vein. Patrick? Well, I've got four of those. <laughs> <laughs> I can see them. But it might be. All this w nonsense about weed I'd to save my bones. Tella isn't a bone Italian, is it? Ossa. I don't know. <laughs> or Sabuco. <laughs> I'm just feeling around, you see. I haven't got any. All this frothy lather coming out of... No, it, it, it couldn't be Red Indian washing day. We believe it is a vein. Or do I? Wait a minute. Yes. <laughs> I think I do, yes. That was precious near a plump there. So who said that? Yes, it was I'm Derek Jacobi. Was that true or was it a bluff? You're looking much too... Oh! Now, the it's just what he said it was. It's the largest vein on the back of your hand, of which Patrick has four. <laughs> I've got one. I haven't got any. <laughs> Rony is the next one, or Rony. I don't know how you pronounce it. Patrick. A Rony is a rectangular wooden box used in Aberdeen for mm. carrying around salted herrings in this box. It would weigh around about a quarter of a crayon, which, as you might know, is spelled C-R-A-N. There, a quarter of a crayon of salted herring would mean around about 60 medium-sized salted herrings. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> right, that was that. Now we have Michael Culver. He says this. Rony is, in fact, a thick brownish-black tar, and you get, it's used mainly in America. Uh, it's used to rub into the backs of sheep, and it's to keep away parasites like flicks and... I knew I was going to have trouble with that. <laughs> Ticks and fleas and... and